Hi, and welcome back to the Red Seed Shellcode Obfuscation Series. In this episode, we're going to be taking a look at an interesting technique where we're going to convert our shellcode into a UUID. So this technique was first observed in the wild being used by the Lazarus group. And it's interesting for a couple of different reasons. One, it's interesting because of uh, its shellcode structured as a UUID. Uh, two, how those UUIDs get moved into memory. And also the way that the Lazarus group was executing the shellcode using something called a callback function, enum system locales A. So that's uh, definitely an interesting one that we're not going to take a look at that last aspect, but we're going to look at the first two. So let's go ahead and take a look at some code that'll help us understand what's going on. So if you're unfamiliar with the UUID, they're also known as a GUID or GUID, a, it's a universally unique identifier or globally unique identifier. And it is a large number that hopefully, if generated correctly, you shouldn't ever have to worry about a collision. There should be more than enough uh, keys available that you would never have a collision while using these. So the way to structure our shellcode as a UUID is actually really pretty easy. So this uh, code was adapted from Bobby Cook's. Um, so it's Bobby Cook's repo called Ninja UUID Runner, um, which he got that code from securehat.co.uk. But it, it's pretty simple. Uh, we use the Python UUID library to do this, we're going to read in our shellcode file, and then we're going to read it in in chunks of 16 bytes at a time. The reason we're doing it 16 bytes at a time is because a UUID uh, would be structured from 16 bytes. It's actually 32 characters long. Uh, however, each shellcode byte is two characters, for instance, FC, 83, E4, so on and so forth. So we're going to read in 16 bytes at a time. If the length of that chunk that we read in is less than 16 bytes, we're going to pad it with NOPs, no ops, which are hex 90. We're going to pad it out so that we have 16 characters in the end. And then we're going to use a format string and call UUID bytes, uh, little endian, and uh, we're going to feed it the bytes from our shellcode. And then we're going to add that to our UUIDs list, or UUIDs string, rather. So now let's go ahead and run that. So. When we run it, you see here we have this structure where it's one, two, three, four. Uh, looks like four bytes, and then two, and then two, and then two, and then I'm not sure uh, how many is here. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. And so this is the structure of a UUID or uh, GUID. Now, when we take a look at this, all of a sudden we can start seeing our shell code. So we see FC uh, 84, or excuse me, FC 84, 83, E4. Uh, so these are flipped around a bit, but we start recognizing our shell code. Just like if we look here, we see FF D5, and then here's that padding with those knobs. But Bobby has a very helpful diagram in the GitHub repo. So let's take a look at that. So this is from the Ninja UUID runner uh, repository. If you're not familiar with it on GitHub, it's at boku7 slash ninja underscore UUID underscore runner. And we're looking in main.c. So this is uh, an example of calc.bin shellcode from Mesplite. However, it's very similar. 
And we see that those first bytes are FC83, E4, F0, E8. So it's very similar to what we've been seeing. But you can see kind of how they get laid out, the way they have to be structured uh, if we want to use them as a UUID. So it's FC4883, E4, right? So these are going backwards, which is exactly what we saw when we looked at the output from the Python program. We see FC4883, E4. So now that is how that is laid out. So let's take a look now at our code to actually use this. Uh, one of the things we need to do is we need to include rpc.h and this pragma uh, to tell it that we want to use rpc rt4 lib because that's where uh, the function that we'll use is stored. So we've got this character array of UUIDs and here's our shellcode. Now we need to figure out the size of our shellcode and we're going to get the size of the UUIDs, multiply it by two to give us a good size. We're going to allocate a memory buffer. That's the size of our shellcode. Now we need to allocate a memory buffer instead of just you know decoding the values because of how things work here. And we're gonna walk through that. So we're going to declare a buffer using virtual alloc, and then we're going to uh, make a void pointer or a null pointer for something called buffer base address. We've got an index variable here. Now we're going to do a loop. We're gonna loop through our UUIDs. And so we're gonna loop through each of these values. It's gonna read this entire string at a time. And it's going to first set the buffer base address to be equal to the address of our buffer that we allocated with the virtual alloc. So it's going to get a memory address plus some I value, some increment, which is zero. So right now, buffer base address is going to be the base address of buffer. And then we're going to call this function, UUID from string A. So UUID from string A works like the name sounds. It creates a binary UUID from a string representation of a UUID. And what's really cool about this is one, we pass it our UUIDs but then we also pass it a pointer to a memory location where that should be stored. So this is effectively copying our shellcode into memory. Most AVs and, and EDRs are looking for a common pattern of allocating memory, copying shellcode in using something like uh, memcopy or RTL move memory. They're looking for allocating memory, copying shellcode into the buffer, and then executing it. And this helps break up that pattern because UUID from string A is actually copying in the shellcode for us. The last bit, we have to shift our buffer over by 16 because we wrote in 16 bytes, right? We've got 16 bytes here. We wrote in 16 bytes into our buffer. Now we need to shift that by 16. Otherwise we'd overwrite some of the shellcode that we already wrote into our buffer. So let's take a look at it. When we run it, we can see the output FC 4883 E4. Um, we see some 90s at the end. That's because of that padding. So we've got FFD5 and then some some knobs that are padding that. So that's exactly what we would expect if it's padded out. It worked. Um, don't worry about this output. That was just some debugging that I had going on. So let's try this. Let's see what Defender thinks about it. No threat found. Great. So now 
Let's upload that to VirusTotal and see what it thinks about it. So in this case, it didn't think it was great. Uh, there was no, no other attempts to obfuscate our shellcode other than structuring it as a UUID. And we can see it was detected by, you know, 37, uh, 37 different engines at the time. So that is, that is more than 50% of the engines detected this. So it is not a great technique by itself uh, for evasion. However, there are some things that we could do. Uh, we could take this value and we could actually encrypt each of our UUIDs and then store those encrypted strings here in uh, the array. Uh, for instance, we could Zor the bytes and then and then perform some operation. We could do some other kind of encryption. There, there are different ways that we could obfuscate the shellcode further so that it doesn't get detected as uh, you know, malicious by all the engines on virus total. So that is something that we could do. However, this technique is very interesting because it allows us to copy that into memory and then break up that, that allocate, copy, and execute pattern that most EDRs are looking for. So there you have it. There's a look at encoding shellcode as IP addresses for obfuscation. In the next episode, we're going to take a look at a similar technique using just a different type of data. Thank <laughs> you.